Introduction to Sir Gawain and the Green Knight As a subject of literary romance, Arthurian tradition never had the centrality in late medieval England it had gained in France. It was only one of a wide range of popular topics like Havelock the Dane, King Horn, and the Troy Story. Nevertheless, Arthur and his court played an ongoing role in English society, written into histories and emulated by aristocrats and kings. In the later 14th or early 15th century, several very distinguished Arthurian poems appeared, such as the alliterative Mort Arthur and Adventures of Arthur. Sir Gawain and the Green Knight is the greatest of the Arthurian romances produced in England. The poem embraces the highest aspirations of the late medieval aristocratic world, both courtly and religious, even while it eloquently admits the human failings that threaten those values. A knight's troth and word, a Christian's election and covenant, the breaking point of a person's or society's virtues, all come in for celebration and painful scrutiny during Gawain's adventure. Like Beowulf, Sir Gawain and the Green Knight comes down to us by the threat of a single copy. Its manuscript contains a group of poems, Sir Gawain, Pearl, Purity, and Patience, that mark their anonymous author as a poet whose range approaches that of his contemporary Chaucer, and whose formal craft is in some ways more ambitious than Chaucer's. Gawain is the work of a highly sophisticated provincial court poet, likely in the Northwest Midlands, working in a form and narrative tradition that is conservative in comparison with Chaucer's. The poet uses alliterative long line, a meter with its root in Anglo-Saxon poetry, the unrhymed alliterative stanzas of irregular length, each end with five shorter rhymed lines, often called a bob-and-wheel stanza. Within these traditional constraints, however, the poem achieves an apex of medieval courtly literature as a superlatively crafted and stylized version of quest romance. The romance never aims to detach itself from society or history, though. It opens and closes by referring to Troy, the ancient fallen empire whose survivors were legendary founders of Britain, a connection well known through Geoffrey of Monmouth. Arthur, their ultimate heir, went on later in his myth to pursue imperial ambitions that, like those of Troy, were foiled by adulterous desire and political infidelity. Sir Gawain also echoes its contemporary world in the technical language of architecture, crafts, and arms. This helps draw in the kind of conservative aristocratic court for which the poem seems to have been written, probably in Cheshire or Lancashire, a somewhat backward region whose nobles remained loyal to Richard II. Along with the pleasure it takes in fine armor and courtly ritual, the poem seems to enfold anxieties about economic pressures of maintaining chivalric display in a period of costly new technology, inflation, and declining income from land. By the time this poem was written, towards the close of the 14th century, Gawain was a famous Arthurian hero. His reputation was ambiguous, though. He was both Arthur's faithful retainer and nephew, but also a suave seducer. Which side of Gawain would dominate in this particular poem? Would he stand for a civilization of Christian chivalry or one of cynical sophistication? The test that begins to answer this question occurs during Arthur's ritual celebrations of Christmas and the New Year, and within the civilized practices of Eucharist and secular feast. A gigantic green knight interrupts Arthur's banquet to offer a deadly game of exchanged axe blows to be resolved in one year's time. Although the green knight, with his ball of holly leaves, seems at first to come from the tradition of the wild man, a giant force of nature itself, he is also a sophisticated knight, gorgeously attired. He knows, too, just how to taunt a young king without quite overstepping the bounds of courtly behavior. Gawain takes up the challenge, but a still greater marvel ensues. As the term of the agreement approaches, Gawain rides off, elaborately armed, to find the Green Knight and fulfill his obligation, even if that means his death. What Gawain encounters first, though, are temptations of character and sexuality even trickier and more crucial than they at first seem. Sir Gawain and the Green Knight is remarkable not only for the intricacies of its plot, but also for the virtuosity of its descriptions, such as the almost elegiac review of the passing seasons, and so the year runs away in yesterday's many. The poem rejoices in the masterful exercise of skill as the mark of civilization.
Beautifully crafted knots appear everywhere, and we encounter artisanal craft as well in narrative elements like the Green Knight's dress, a dazzling mixture of leafy green and jeweler's gold, Gawain's decorated shield and arms, and the expertise of the master of the hunt who carves up the prey of Gawain's host with ritual precision. Even Gawain's exquisite courtly manners appear as a civilizing artifice. The ambition of the poem's own craft is equally evident in its extraordinary range of formal devices. Preeminent among these is the symbolic register of number. The poem can be seen as a single unit, circling back to the Trojan scene with which it begins. It has a double structure, too, as it shifts between the courts of Arthur and Gawain's mysterious host. In this manuscript, it is divided into four parts, fits, that respond to the seasonal description at the opening of Part 2. The narrative proper ends by echoing the very start of the poem at line 2525 in the original Middle English, itself a multiple of fives that recalls the pentangle on Gawain's shield symbolizing his virtues. The final rhyming stanza, with its formula of grace and salvation, brings the line total to 2530, whose individual digits add up to ten, a number associated with the divine in medieval numerology. This symbolic structure can seem sometimes overdetermined. A range of elements, however, invites the readers to come at the poem from other perspectives. The poem's very circularity, narrative and formal, allows it to be viewed from beginning or ending. From the front, it is a poem of male accomplishment, largely celebrating men's courts and men's virtues, even men's horses. At the other end, however, it focuses on a court presided over by an old woman, later called a goddess, a court whose eruption into the Arthurian world is explained as the playing out of an old and mysterious rivalry between two queens. Male, even patriarchal from one direction, the poem seems matriarchal, almost pagan from the other. For all its formal cohesion and celebration of craft, the poem also pulls the reader back and keeps its mysteries intact by leaving many narrative loose ends and unanswered questions. Unresolvable ambiguities reside most clearly in the pentangle on Gawain's shield and in the green girdle whose true owner remains uncertain. For all their differences, both are figures that insist on repetition, end where they begin, and possess a geometry that can be traced forward or backward. Yet the static perfection of the pentangle is subtly set against the protean green girdle, which passes through so many hands, alters its shape, being untied and retied repeatedly, and connects with so many issues in the poem, mortality, women's power, Gawain's fault, and the acceptance of that fault by the whole Arthurian court. The girdle becomes an image both of flaw and of triumph, and of all the loose ends in this early episode of the Arthurian myth. The girdle also serves to link Sir Gawain to political and social issues of the poet's own time particularly efforts to revalidate a declining system of chivalry. After the last line in the manuscript, a later medieval hand added, Honi soit qui mal pens, shamed be he who thinks ill thereof, the motto of the Royal Order of the Garter, founded by Edward III in 1349, to promote a revival of knighthood. The Arthurian myth has already been redeployed, but to buttress royal power when Edward III refounded a round table in 1344. King Arthur's wisdom at the close of Gawain's adventure lies in transforming Gawain's shame, rage, and humiliated sense of sin into an emblem at once of mortal humanity and aristocratic cohesion. This is the place, back with the king and ritually connected with the Order of the Garter, where the closed circle of the poem opens to the social, historical world of empire, court, and kingship. Part 1 of Sir Gawain and the Green Knight Translated by J.R.R. Tolkien when the siege and the assault had ceased at Troy, and the fortress fell in flame to firebrands and ashes, the traitor who the contrivance of treason there fashioned was tried for his treachery, and most true upon earth. It was Aeneas, the noble and his renowned kindred, who then laid under them lands, and lords became of well nigh all the wealth in the western isles. When royal Romulus to Rome his road had taken, in great pomp and pride he peopled it first, and named it with his own name that yet now it bears. 
Tyrius went to Tuscany, and towns founded. Langebert to Lombardy uplifted halls, and far over the French flood Felix Brutus, on many a broad bank and bray, Britain established full fair, where strange things, strife and sadness, at wiles in the land did fare, and each other grief and gladness oft fast have followed there. And when fair Britain was founded by this famous lord, bold men were bred there who in battle rejoiced, and many a time that betide they troubles aroused. In this domain more marvels have by men been seen than in any other that I know of since that olden time. But of all that here abode in Britain as kings, ever was Arthur most honored, as I have heard men tell. Wherefore a marvel among men I mean to recall, a sight strange to see some men have held it, of one of the wildest adventures of the wonders of Arthur. If you will listen to this, lay but a little while now. I will tell it at once, as in town I have heard it told, as it is fixed and fettered, in story brave and bold, thus linked and truly lettered, as was loved in this land of old. This king lay at Camelot at Christmas tide with many a lovely lord, lieges most noble, indeed of the table round, all those tried brethren, amid merriment unmatched, and mirth without care, they tourneyed there many a time the trusty knights, and jousted full joyously these gentle lords. Then to the court they came at carols to play, for there the feast was unfailing full fifteen days, with all meats and all mirth that men could devise, such gladness and gaiety as was glorious to hear, din of voices by day and dancing by night. All happiness in the highest in halls and in bowers had the lords and the ladies such as they loved most dearly. With all the bliss of this world they abode together, the knights most renowned after the name of Christ, and the ladies most lovely that ever life enjoyed, and he, king most courteous, who that court possessed. For all that folk so fair did in their first estate abide, under heaven the first in fame, their king most high in pride, it would now be hard to name a troop in war so tried." While New Year was yet young, that yester eve had arrived, that day double dainties on the dais were served, when the king was there, come with his courtiers to the hall, and the chanting of the choir in the chapel had ended. With loud clamor and cries, both clerks and laymen, Noel announced anew, and named it full often. Then nobles ran anon with New Year's gifts, Hansels, Hansels, they shouted, and handed them out competed for those presents in playful debate. Ladies laughed loudly, though they were lost the game, and he that won was not woeful, as many well believed. All this merriment they made, till their meat was served. Then they washed, and mannerly went to their seats, ever the highest for the worthiest, as well held to the best. Queen Guinevere the Gay was with grace in the midst. Of the adorned dais set, dearly was it arrayed, finest sindal at her sides, a ceiling above her, of true tissue of Toulouse, and tapestries of Tharsia, that were embroidered and bound with the brightest gems one might prove and appraise to purchase for coin any day, that loveliest lady there, on them glanced with eyes of grey, that he found ever one more fair in sooth might no man say. But Arthur would not eat until all were served. His youth made him so merry with the moods of a boy. He liked light-hearted life, so loved he the less, either longed to be lying or longed to be seated. So worked on him his young blood and wayward brain. And another rule, moreover, was his reason besides, that in pride he had appointed, it pleased him not to eat, upon festivals so fair, ere he first were apprised, of some strange story or stirring adventure, or some moving marvel that he might believe in, of noblemen, knighthood, or some new adventures, or a challenger should come, a champion seeking to join with him in jousting, in jeopardy to set his life against life, each allowing the other the favor of fortune, were she fairer to him. This was the king's custom, wherever his court was holden, at each famous feast, among his fair company in hall, so his face doth proud appear, and he stands up stout and tall, all young in the new year, much mirth he makes withal. Thus there stands up straight the stern king himself, talking before the high table of trifles courtly. There good Gawain was set at Guinevere's side, with Agravain a la Durmaine on the other side seated. 
both their lords' sister sons, loyal-hearted knights. Bishop Baldwin had the honor of the board's service, and Iwain Urien's son ate beside him. These dined on the dais, and daintily fared, and many a loyal lord below at the long tables. Then forth came the first course, with fanfare and trumpets, on which many bright banners bravely were hanging. Noise of drums then anew, with the noble pipes, warbling wild and keen, wakened their music, so that many hearts rose high hearing their playing. Then forth was brought a feast, fair of the noblest, multitude of fresh meats on so many dishes, that free places were few in front of the people, to set the silver things full of soups on cloth so white. Each lord of his liking there, without lack, took with delight twelve plates to every pair, good beer, and wine all bright. Now of their service I will say nothing more, for you are all well aware that no want would there be. Another noise that was new drew near on a sudden, so that their lord might have leave at least to take food, for hardly had the music but a moment ended, and the first course in the court, as was custom, been served, when there passed through the portals a perilous horseman, the mightiest on middle earth in measure of height, with his gorge to his girdle so great and so square, and his loins and his limbs so long and so huge, that half a troll upon earth I trow that he was, but the largest man alive at least I declare him and yet the seemliest for his size that could sit on a horse, for though in back and in breast his body was grim, both his paunch and his waist were properly slight, and all his features followed his fashion so gay and mode, for at that hue men gaped aghast, in his face and form that showed, as a fay man fell he passed, and green all over glowed. All of green were they made, both garments and man, a coat tight and close that clung to his sides, a rich robe above it all arrayed within, with fur finely trimmed, showing fair fringes of handsome ermine gay, as his hood was also. That was lifted from his locks and laid on his shoulders, and trim hose tight drawn of tincture alike, that clung to his calves, and clear spurs below of bright gold on silk broideries banded most richly, though unshod were his shanks, for shoeless he rode, and verily all this vesture was of verdure clear, both the bars of, on his belt and the bright stones besides, that were richly arranged in his array so fair, set on himself and on his saddle upon silk fabrics, it would be too hard to rehearse one half of the trifles that were embroidered upon them, what with birds and flies and a gay glory of green and ever gold in the midst, the pendants of his portrait, his proud crouper, his molans, and all the metal to say more were enameled. Even the stirrups that he stood in were stained the same, and his saddle bows in suit, and their sumptuous skirts, which ever glimmered and glinted with all green jewels. Even the horse that upheld him in hue was the same, I tell, a green horse, great and thick, a stallion stiff to quell, embroidered bridle quick, he matched his master well. Very gay was this great man, guised all in green, and the hair of his head, with his horses accorded, fair flapping locks enfolded his shoulders, a big beard like a bush over his breast hanging, that with the handsome hair from his head falling, was sharp shorn to an edge just short of his elbows, so that half his arms under it were hid, as it were, in a king's cabadoche that encloses his neck. The mane of that mighty horse was of much the same sort, well curled and all combed with many curious knots woven in the gold wire about the wondrous green ever a strand of the hair and a string of the gold the tail and the top lock were twined all to match and both bound with a band of brilliant green with dear jewels bedight to the dock's ending and twisted then on top with a tight knitted knot on which many burnished bells of bright gold jingled such a mount on middle earth or man to ride him was never beheld in that hall with eyes ere that time, for there his glance was as lightning bright, so did all that saw him swear, no man would have the might, they thought, his blows to bear. And yet he had not a helm, nor a hauberk either, not a pisane, nor a plate that was proper to arms, not a shield, not a shaft, for shock or for blow, but in his one hand he held a holly bundle, that is greatest in greenery when the groves are leafless, and an axe in the other, 
ugly and monstrous, a ruthless weapon, a right for one in rhyme to describe. The head was as large and as long as an elwand, a branch of green steel and of beaten gold, the bit burnished bright and broad at the edge, as well shaped for shearing as sharp razors. The stem was a stout staff, by which sternly he gripped it, all bound with iron about to the base of the handle, and engraven in green in graceful patterns, lapped round with a lanyard, and was lashed to the head, and down the length of the haft was looped many times. The tassels of price were tied there in plenty to bosses of the bright green, braided most richly. Such was he that now hastened in, the hall entering, pressing forward to the dais, no peril he feared, to none gave he greeting, gazing above them, and the first word that he winged, Now where is, he said, the governor of this gathering, for gladly I would on the same set my sight, and with himself now talk in town. On the courtiers he cast his eye, and rolled it up and down. He stopped and stared to a spy, who there had most renown. Then they looked up for a long while on that lord gazing, for every man marvelled what it could mean indeed that horseman and horse such a hue should come by, as to grow green as the grass, and greener it seemed, than green enamel on gold glowing far brighter. All stared that stood there and stole up nearer, watching him and wondering what in the world he would do, for many marvels they had seen, but to match this nothing, wherefore a phantom and fay magic folk there thought it, and so to answer little eager was any of those knights, and astounded as his stern voice stone still they sat there in a swooning silence through that solemn chamber, as if all had dropped into a dream, so died their voices away, not only I deem for dread, but of some t'was their courtly way, to allow their lord and head to the guest his word to say. Then Arthur, before the high dais, beheld this wonder, and freely with fair words, for fearless was he ever, saluted him, saying, Lord, to this lodging thou art welcome. The head of this household, Arthur, is my name. Alight as thou lovest me, and linger, I pray thee, and what may thy wish be, and while we shall learn. Nay, so help me, quoth the horseman, he that on high is thrown to pass any time in this place was no part of my errand. But since thy praise is prince, so proud are uplifted, and thy castle and courtiers are accounted the best, the stoutest in steel gear that on steeds may ride, most eager and honourable of the earth's people, valiant to vie with in other virtuous sports, and here in knighthood renowned, as in noised in my ears. Tis that has fetched me hither by my faith at this time. You may believe by this branch that I am bearing here that I pass as one in peace, no peril seeking. For had I set forth to fight in fashion of war, I have a hauberk at home, and a helm also, a shield, and a sharp spear shining brightly, and other weapons to wield too, as well I believe. But since I crave for no combat, my clothes are softer. Yet if thou be so bold, as abroad is published, thou wilt grant of thy goodness the game that I ask by right. Then Arthur answered there, and said, Sir noble knight, if battle thou seek, thus bear, thou'lt fail not here to fight. Nay, I wish for no warfare, on my word I tell thee, here about on these benches are but beardless children. Were I hasped in armour on a high charger, there is no man here to match me. Their might is so feeble, and so I crave in this court only a Christmas pastime. Since it is Yule and New Year, and you are young here and merry, if any so hardy in this house here holds that he is, if so bold be his blood or his brain be so wild, that he stoutly dare strike one stroke for another, then I will give him as my gift this gizam, costly, this axe, tis heavy enough, to handle as he pleases, and I will abide the first brunt. Here bear as I sit. If any fellow be so fierce as my faith to test, tither let him haste to me, and lay hold of this weapon. I hand it over forever. He can have it as his own, and I will stand a stroke from him, stuck still on the floor, provided thou lay this law that I may deliver him another. Claim I, and yet a respite I'll allow till a year and a day go by. Come quick, and let's see now, if any here dare reply. 
If he astounded them at first, yet stiller were they then. All the household in the hall, both high men and low, the man on his mount moved in the saddle, and rudely his red eyes he rolled then about, bent his bristly brows all brilliantly green, and swept round his beard to see who would rise. When none in converse would accost him, he coughed then loudly, stretched himself haughtily, and straightway exclaimed, "'What? Is this Arthur's house?' said he thereupon, "'the rumour of which runs through realms unnumbered. "'Where now is your haughtiness and your high conquests, "'your fierceness and fell mood, and your fine boasting? "'Now are the revels of the royalty of the round table "'overwhelmed by a word by one man spoken, "'for all blench now abased ere a blow is offered.' "'With that he laughed so loud that their lord was angered, the blood shot for shame into the shining cheeks and face. As wroth as wind he grew, so all did in that place. Then near to the stout man drew the king of the fearless race, and said, Marry, good man, tis madness thou askest, and since folly thou hast sought, thou deservest to find it. I know no lord that is alarmed by thy loud words here. Give me now thy gizarm in God's name, sir, and I will bring thee the blessing thou hast begged to receive. Quick then he came to him, and caught it from his hand. Now the lordly man loftily alighted on foot. Now Arthur holds his axe, and the haft grasping sternly, he stirs it about, his stroke considering. The stout man before him there stood his full height, higher than any man in that house by a head and yet more. With stern face he stood, he stroked at his beard, and with expression impassive he pulled down his coat. No more disturbed or distressed at the strength of his blows than if someone as he sat and served him a drink of wine. From beside the queen, Gawain, to the king did then incline, I implore with prayer plain that this match should now be mine. Would you, my worthy lord? said Gawain to the king, bid me abandon this bench, and stand by you there, so that I might, without discourtesy, might be excused from the table. And my liege lady were not loth to permit me, I would come to you your counsel before your courteous fare, for I find it unfitting, as in fact it is held, when a challenge in your chamber makes choices so exalted, though you yourself be desirous to accept it in person, while many bold men about you on bench are seated on earth, there are, I hold, none more honest of purpose, no figures fairer on field where fighting is waged. I am the weakest, I am aware, and in wit feeblest, and the least loss, if I live not, if one would learn the truth. Only because you are my uncle is honor given me. Save your blood and my body, I boast of no virtue. And since this affair is so foolish that it no wise befits you, and I have requested it first, accord it then to me. If my claim is uncalled for, without cavil shall judge this court, to consult the knights draw near, and this plan they all support, the king with crown to clear, and give Gawain the sport. The king then commanded that he quickly should rise, and he readily uprose and directly approached, kneeling humbly before his highness and laying hand on the weapon, and he lovingly relinquished it, and lifting his hand, gave him God's blessing, and graciously enjoined him, take his hand, and his heart should be hearty alike. Take care, cousin, quoth the king, one cut to address, and if thou learnest him his lesson, I believe very well that thou wilt bear any blow that he gives back later. Gawain goes boldly to the great man with Gizarm in hand, and he boldly abides there. He blenched not at all. Then next said to Gawain, the knight all in green, Let's tell again our agreement, ere we go any further. I'd know first, sir knight, thy name, I entreat thee, to tell it to me truly, that I may trust in thy word. In good faith, quoth the good knight, I, Gawain, am called, who bring thee this buffet. Let be what may follow. And at this time a twelve-month in thy turn have another, with whatever weapon thou wilt, and in the world with none else but me. The other man answered again, I am passing pleased, said he, upon my life, Sir Gawain, that this stroke should be struck by thee. Begad, said the green knight, Sir Gawain, I am pleased to find from thy fist the favour I asked for, and thou hast promptly repeated, and plainly hast stated, without abatement, the bargain I begged of the king here, save that thou must assure me, sir, on thy honour, that thou seek me thyself, search where thou thinkest, I may be found near or far, and fetch thee such payment as thou deliverest me to-day before these lordly people. Where should I light on thee? quoth Gawain. 
Where look for thy place? I have never learned from where thou livest, by the Lord that hath made. And I know thee not, knight, thy name, nor thy court. But teach me the true way, and tell me what men call thee. And I will apply all my purpose the path to discover, and that I swear thee for certain, and solemnly promise. That is enough in New Year. There is no need of more. And the great man in green, to Gawain the courtly, if I tell thee the truth of it, when I have taken the knock, and thou handily hast hit me, if in haste I announce then my house, and my home, and mine own title, then thou canst call and inquire, and keep the agreement. And if I waste not a word, thou'lt win better fortune, for thou mayest linger in thy land, and look no further. But stay, to thy grim tool, now take heed, sir. Let us try thy knocks to-day. Gladly, said he, indeed, sir. And his axe he stroked in play. The green knight on the ground now gets himself ready. Leaning a little with the head, he lays bare the flesh, and his locks long and lovely he lifts over his crown, letting the naked neck, as was needing, appear, his left foot on the floor before him placing. Gawain gripped on his axe, gathered and raised it from aloft, let it swiftly land where twas naked, so that the sharp of his blade shivered the bones and sank clear through the fat and clove it asunder and the blade of the bright steel then bit into the ground. The fair head of the floor fell from the shoulders, and folk fended it with their feet, as forth it went rolling. The blood burst from the body, bright on the greenness, and yet neither faltered nor fell the fierce man at all. But stoutly he strode forth, still strong in his shanks, and roughly he reached out among the rows that stood there, and caught up his comely head, and quickly appraised it and then hastened to his horse, laid hold of the bridle, stepped into the stirrup iron, and strode up aloft, his head by the hair in his hand holding, and he settled himself in the saddle as firmly as if unharmed by mishap, though in the hall he might wear no head. His trunk he twisted round, that gruesome body that bled, and many fear that found, as soon as his speech was sped. For the head in his hand he held it straight. Towards the fairest at the table he twisted the face, and it lifted up its eyelids, and looked at them broadly, and made such words with its mouth as might be recounted. See thou get ready, Gawain, to go as thou vowest, and as faithfully seek till thou find me, good sir, as thou hast promised in this place in the presence of these knights. To the green chapel go thou, and get thee, I charge thee, such a dint as thou hast dealt. Indeed, thou hast earned a nimble knock in return on New Year's morning. The knight of the green chapel I am known to many, so if to find me thou endeavor, thou fail it not to do so. Therefore come, or to be called a craven thou deservest. With a rude roar and rush his reins he turned them, and hastened out through the hall door with his head in his hand, and fire of the flint grew from the feet of his charger. To what country he came in the court no man knew, nor more they had learned from what land he had journeyed. Meanwhile the king and Sir Gawain at the green man laugh and smile, yet to men had appeared t'was plain a marvel beyond denial. Though Arthur the High King in his heart marveled, he let no sign of it be seen, but said then aloud to the queen, so comely with courteous words, Dear lady, to-day be not downcast at all. Such cunning play well becomes the Christmas tide interludes, and the like, and laughing, and singing, amid these noble dances of knights and dames. Nonetheless to my food I may fairly betake me, for a marvel I have met, and I may not deny it. He glanced at Sir Gawain, with good point he said, Come, hang up thine axe, sir, it has hewn now enough. And over the table they hung it on the tapestry behind, where all men might remark it, a marvel to see, and by true token might tell of that adventure. Then to a table they turned, those two lords together, the king and his good kinsmen, and courtly men served them, with all dainties double, the dearest there might be, with all manner of meats, and with minstrelsy too. With delight that day they held, till the land came the night again. Sir Gawain, now take heed, lest fear make thee refrain from daring and dangerous deed that thou hast in hand taken. End of part one.